Good morning. Welcome, everyone. First of all, thank you to the Migration Policy Institute for this invitation and to Andrew Seeley and to other colleagues from the MPI who have been working on these issues that are ex extremely important. This panel will be addressing the Nicaraguan situation after the conflict uh, after April 2018, and we're going to address issues with regards to uh, what we've been seeing in terms of the trends. Costa Rica is a very important uh, country with regards to Nicaraguan migration, and it's been truly has been working in solidarity and has been a very hospitable country towards Nicaragua. Before I begin, I would like to also welcome the ambassador of Costa Rica to the United States, Dr. Fernando Yorca, who is here visiting us. And I think uh, we should start with the following. When we talk about Nicaraguan migration, there is a historical tradition, at least in the past 50 years, in which the mobility or movement of Nicaraguans towards the rest of the world has been quite uh, important. And this surged after the uh, conflict that the country uh, faced after Somoza was uh, defeated and overthrown. Uh, after, before April 18th of 2018, it was estimated that more than 700,000 Nicaraguans were outside of Nicaragua, and half of them roughly in Costa Rica, and a pro large number, around 300,000 in the United States, and the rest were distributed in different countries such as Spain and, to a lesser degree, Panama. The political crisis has exacerbated the conflict in Central America, and this was due to the level of repression that was seen in the country. Dialogue was rejected, and this dialogue was, uh, was an attempt to provide a peaceful solution to what was occurring in the country, and that resulted in the migration of people. So from April to 2018 to uh, October of this year, we're talking about 200,000 Nicaraguans who have left their country. For a country out of 6 million people, we're talking 3% of the population that has left. So we think that by next year, another 50,000 Nicaraguans will leave their country. And we see that in light of the uh, de deteriorating economic crisis in their country for the past three years, there has been a collapse of their economic growth. And it's also, we've seen that it will be 500, more than 500,000 Nicaraguans that will be unemployed. Currently, about 100,000 this year uh, will not have uh, anything to eat. And there is no, there's truly no uh, positive uh, solution that might be foreseen to the political conflict. Nicaragua is one of eight countries in the Americas that is part of the migrant flow that we see throughout the region. In addition to Haiti and Cuba, the countries of the Northern Triangle, Nicaragua, Venezuela, we see that Nicaragua is one of the countries that has seen a great movement of its people, and they are fleeing their country as a result of the political and economic instability in their country. We have seen four trends, and many of these trends were discussed in the previous panel, and obviously we see that they obviously are having an impact on the migrant uh, situation. One is the economic vulnerability of these people when they go to the host countries, whether it's Costa Rica or Panama. This migrant flow that we see, and the one we saw in Panama before the crisis, we would see there were 13,000 Nicaraguans at a minimum in Nicaragua, from Nicaragua in Panama. Now we're talking more than 40,000 Nicaraguans in Panama. Panama's like Chile that overnight it became um, a host country. And basically, this economic, uh, situation is a key factor 
uh, in Nicaragua. There is an economic recession in Costa Rica. We're talking also about the legalization of these uh, migrants is also something that is taken into account. To determine their legal status, uh, whether it's in Panama or Costa Rica, is something that is quite complicated for them. And thirdly, there's an issue of cultural and societal integration of the Nicaraguans, how Nicaraguans are being integrated into a society like Costa Rica in, a, in the circumstances under which um, they are right now. Is that's, that's a key issue. And another issue that is being talked uh, has been briefly touched upon in the previous panel is those issues that have to do with national and international issues. For example, Nicaragua is part of the inter-American system, but it is seen as a country that has violated its constitution. And according to the OAS, it is a country that uh, Article 20 of the uh, International Charter has, uh, or Democratic Charter has been applied, as well as Venezuela. So that is another issue that has to be addressed with regards to refugees. So it's not just uh, the status of refugees, um, but this uh, latter issue that is also has to be taken out. So these are the four trends that we've talked about. We have three panelists with us that asked of me, and we're kind of do like a Russian roulette kind of questions. They don't know the questions they're going to be asked. So well. I'm a Nicaraguan. I'm Nicaraguan. They're Costa Rican, so I'm going to like really uh, give it to them. So anyway, so that's where we're going. To my left, we have my colleague Alberto Cortez. He's a professor at the University of Costa Rica. He's a professor uh, who has worked on migration issues, and he's of Nicaraguan origin. He's someone who is an an expert on um, these issues for, the long, for a long time. To my right, I have the Vice Minister of um, the Government, Carlos Andres Torres, who has been working in the integration of the Costa Rican policies as it regards to the Nicaraguans in Costa Rica. And thirdly, I have Harold Villegas, who presides the Commission of Visas and Refugees. He's the one who says no to the visas. Anyway. Well, that's what they told me to say. No, anyway. I think the first question, perhaps, is the different uh, situations that we all face. Costa Rica saw this as a political saw this political situation and the humanitarian crisis. It never closed its doors upon them, and it has let a lot of Nicaraguans come into the country. And it's an important part of the history of, of Costa Rica. There's a polarization in our country, but there's also an economic recession. So now, how is Costa Rica responding in light of this situation? Perhaps, Alberto, you could talk a little bit about how the what, what's the profile of the Nicaraguans who have entered uh, Costa Rica in the past 18 months? So, good morning. First of all, Manuel, I'd like to thank the Migration Policy Institute for this um, conference and allowing us this opportunity to talk. And I think we're uh, going to talk about a lot of issues that's going to help us in the um, formulation of migration policies in Costa Rica in response to your, your question, I think it would be worth noting that this migrant uh, flow that we've seen in the recent year is different to that that we saw in previous years from Nicaraguans, uh, based especially those uh, that migration we saw in the 1990s. Nicaragua and Costa Rica have a very uh, important relationship in terms of migration. We could probably see uh, how the, in the bananas in the 19th century and 20th century, Costa Rica brought a lot of migrants from other parts of the world, especially Nicaraguans. So we've had a very uh, tight relationship with the Nicaraguans. In the 1990s, from the past century, we saw that the migration coming to uh, Costa Rica is more of a labor kind of a uh, migrant. We have seen in a decade we had more than 200,000 people who came to work 
in different areas of agriculture in Costa Rica, especially and also in construction, in um, housework, especially women. We've seen that there's a, a great number of women who were part of these migrants. So that is something that kept going, and we saw that from the 1990s through April of, of last year, of 2018. I mean, with, perhaps with dips, ebbs and flows of how they would come, depending on their economic situation, and as well as how they integrate into society. Some came uh, on a temporary basis, on a seasonal basis, and some on a semi-permanent basis. After April 18th of 2018, we've seen that the migration, migration of um, Nicaraguans into Costa Rica are more of a refugee status. They're escaping the political repression of their country. And they've trying to uh, avoid the violation of their human rights to which they uh, were subjected in their country. It's a very young population, a lot of university students. Many of them are students, and we've also seen a high level of professionals. Many of them are highly skilled. They have either a degree or a professional degree. So obviously you see a difference in terms of the different kinds of uh, migrants that would come to our country. It's a highly politicized migrant uh, population in the sense that there are more in terms of their citizen participation or civic participation. They're not necessarily um, people related to the armed conflicts because in the 60s and the 70s, we saw a lot of uh, people seeking asylum from Nicaragua into um, Costa Rica. We saw even our own current uh, dictator, president, um, sought refuge or asylum back then. This is a highly a political, um, not a highly political group, but it, there are people who have um, were very involved in the movements of civil society in their country. And these migrants is highly organized. They are also uh, talking about the need to have a civil uh, political change in, in the country. So I think that's something that makes them different from other uh, migrations that we've seen from that country. Thank you, Alberto. There's a word that we're talking about is citizen participation. How is the government of Costa Rica approaching the entry of Nicaraguans into their countries, but not only to be part of society, but also in how the daily life um, applies to them. We've seen uh, security issues that have been addressed. We're talking about paramilitary members of the Nicaragua, of Nicaragua who have come to Costa Rica who perhaps are pursuing the, or persecuting uh, Nicaraguans who have uh, come to our to Nicaragua, uh, sorry, to Costa Rica, people who have not found work, and there's also an economy that perhaps is not responding to these needs. And how is the government approaching all this? Well, thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here at, in the Immigration Policy Institute. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. It's a good question. I can say that this migrant flow and uh, that we've had in our country kind of makes it a little bit more complicated when we talk about our institutions. Not necessarily that's collapsing or on the verge of collapse, but there is a, a kind of a stay, if you will, of how to approach um, all the different um, situations that we're facing. So especially when it comes to uh, the refugees. We have been expediting the different processes for these um, people. We have 76,000 uh, requests for refugees, and similar to Mexico's situation, which is a much larger country. So we also have to understand that Costa Rica is a country in which 10% of its population is uh, comprised of migrants. So we understand that it's not just uh, people from Nicaragua. We have Salvadorans who are coming in, people who are deserting the Maras, their gangs, people that are being persecuted into Costa Rica, and they've expressed that 
they are being persecuted. So from that standpoint, there is um, a great concern for the safety of these people, but we also want to make sure that we identify who they are and that they undergo a regularization process. The ca cattle industry and the different agriculture industry is um, providing a lot of uh, thousands of uh, jobs that Costa Ricans are not um, filling those jobs. So we're trying to expedite these, pro these uh, processes for the foreigners. So they can go to the offices of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Cattle so they can uh, apply for these uh, jobs. So we first have to identify and regularize the, the process because in having this under registration, that entails a lack of knowledge or leads to a lack of knowledge and perhaps uh, promotes crime because we see what we call in Costa Rica what we call these hawks or these uh, people or these mediators who uh, benefit from all this. So we're trying to eliminate that practice in our country by regularizing and prioritizing the processes, but we also have to focus on security. And um, I'm going to also talk about the, the plan of mixed migration flows that we have in our country, and it addresses this last situation in which we're able to integrate these people and that they're able to live in our country with and sustain themselves. And we, although we are grateful for the help of the international community, our president has stated that we need to create uh, projects and bills um, that are more on the long-term focus because without them, we're not going to be able to truly do our work well and not just at the local level, but we also have to think about how we create these projects with the regional uh, development programs because it's, it entails not just Costa Rica, but it also, you have to take into account the entire region. Costa Rica is trying as hard as it can to create these best practices, but there's a huge demand on our work. So if Obviously, the international community has uh, given us officers and, and programs and help and, and buildings and some sort of humanitarian aid. The time that this does not become sustainable, then we're going to have to see that uh, Costa Ricans are the ones who are going to have to maybe migrate. So Venezuela for many years was a host country, and I don't think it ever expected to be a country in which their people would flee. And we see that with Colombia as well, and I think it's a very volatile and um, a very volatile situation. So we need to focus on sustainability and to see also what, how do we see ourselves five, ten years from now and, and have plans in, in place for that. So our daily life sometimes uh, consumes our focus. So I think we need to really sit down and think what is going to happen, what are our expectations uh, from here to five years, Knowing that there is political uncertainty, there's economic uncertainty in our region, not just in our region, but also in Nicaragua and Venezuela and the Northern Triangle. And at one point, the United States, also with regards to its migration policy, uh, will mean that Costa Rica will become a refuge for uh, being a host country. And I don't think closing the borders is an option for us. The president has stated as much. So as long as he remains president, uh, it's not going to happen. I don't think closing the borders and being restrictive is just going to lead to more corruption. And I think that humanitarian aid that is palliative and is immediate can also uh, create or lead to even more poverty. So I think these ambitious and visionary development programs are the ones that we need to create. So the big question here is, is how? We know what, but most of the solution is will rely on how are we able to implement all of these programs and be successful at them. Thank you so much. Harold, there is uh, great expectations as to formalizing the mig migrant status of Nicaraguans. There's also, the government has also been criticized that it is too slow or maybe too inefficient when it comes to um, grant that refugee status. In July of this year, for example, one of the Nicaraguan activists was saying only 3% of the requests for asylum have been 
uh, approved. Could you give us a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail as how many people have applied asylum, how many people have applied for refugee status? What is the current situation? Yes, good morning to everybody. I would like to thank you, Andrew, for this invitation. I think it is important that we see uh, migration as part of the political agenda, I mean, and the policies of our countries, especially when it comes to Nicaraguans and Costa Rica. We are a country that is very small, and I think by being small, we have um, become more visible, uh, especially with um, the situation regarding Venezuela. So I think Costa Rica and Nicaragua and Nicaraguans in Costa Rica should be part of um, what we talk about. Costa Rica, historically, has been a country of immigrants. We have Chinese, Italians, Germans. And up until a few years ago, Costa Rica has been recognizing in its constitution that we are a multi-ethnic and diverse country. And I think that's a great advancement that we've done. And I think it's enriched our country. There are four categories for a, a foreigner to be able to establish him or herself. We have residents, non-residents, temporary, and exceptional uh, categories. Within this uh, last category, we have the refugee status. Refugee status is an exceptional status to to the migrant. It is a different category as it applies to the different other categories that we have in our country. It has to do with the recognition or acknowledgement of human rights. In my country, to be recognized as a refugee status, that is um, granted by the Commission of Visas and Refugees, which comprises the Ministry of Security and his or her representative, the Ministry of Labor, and the Ministry of Foreign Relations, or its representative. I am currently the representative of the Ministry of Security within this commission. Costa Rica is quite different uh, to other countries because we have the Ministry of Security and then we have the Ministry of Government. Carlos is the Vice Minister of Government and, and both ministries have one minister and he's the Minister of Security. The Minister of Security in Costa Rica is the same Minister of Government as Security. So within the Ministry of Government, we have the Bureau of Immigration. And within the Bureau of Migration, we have the Department of uh, Refugees, which is a technical agency, which is the one that recommends or makes its recommendations to the Commission. I think other countries address refugees and migration status as part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The person arrives in Costa Rica and can apply for refugee status. They are given an appointment and perhaps it uh, takes a couple of months or a year to get uh, that appointment. Um, and uh, he or she arrives at the appointment, they're interviewed, and the person who interviews that uh, refugee applicant, who is an expert on uh, this issue, is the one who makes the recommendations to the commission. As a commission, we decide if we accept that recommendation or not. I stated that refugee status is an exceptional uh, category in our country, and there are five requirements that must be met to be able to be accepted or recognized as a refugee. One is that that person must apply within Costa Rica or in Costa Rican territory. It cannot be done outside of Costa Rica. It has to be applied for inside the country. Two, he or she must show 
demonstrate that that there's a based fear that is uh, based on um, a that is based on uh, on a, f a true a f a fear. So we also have another requirement that they are they prove that they're being persecuted for they must belong to a vulnerable group whether they're students uh, they can be a, a woman they might be part of the LGBTQ community and five they must show that they don't have protection in their country of origin. So the statute of um, or status of refugee is granted or not based on these five requirements. Up until April 18th of 2018, we received, we would receive maybe on average 100 applications for refugee, for refugee status a year. Thereafter, after April 18th, we have been receiving 2,500 applications per month, per month. And within the refugee status uh, department, which is under the Depart Bureau of Migration, we've had, we used to have five officers, five officials, which was, you know, standard to, what, to have 100 um, requests now we have 2,500 requests per month. And thanks to the UNHCR, CHR um, cooperation, we've been able to have increase the number of officials to 35. So they're all experts on refugee status and they're all paid for and provided by the UNCHR. Without that help, I mean, we would be so far behind. And obviously, <coughs> many of the Nicaraguan citizens have told us is this is something that they need. Uh, obviously, they need this to be more expeditious. And uh, up until today, in 2018 and 2019, we have had 76,000 request for uh, refugee status. And up until today, we have to attend still 40, over 40,000 um, requests for asylum, in which 99% of these requests coming, are coming from Nicaraguan citizens. Historically speaking, Costa Rica has granted 4,954 um, applications for refugee status. Out of those, 258 are Colombians, 966 are citizens of the northern regions or countries like El Salvador, 456 are from Nicaragua, Venezuela, 344, Cuba, and 378. So historically speaking, our country has granted only 5,000 uh, applications for refugee status, and more than half have come from Colombians. Now, the dates this is data as of today only in September of this year, September only of this year. We had 2,547 refuge applications from Nicaragua followed. No, this is date, this is data as of September followed by El Salvador citizens with 2,065, followed by Cuba with 1,096. Colombia, 
Venezuela, 204. This is the data for the entire year, but I'm going to read now the data for October only from Nicaragua, 2,500. Venezuela, 204. Cuba, 192. Colombia, 65. China, 33. El Salvador, 45. Honduras, 26. Mexico, 4. As you can see, we are a little bit overburdened in terms of the number of applications that we have received. And the country has made a huge effort because luckily our institutions are really strong, but we have made a huge effort to try to address and resolve a lot of these applications. Microphone, the interpreter didn't hear the question. The answer is between seven and 10% approval. When the person submits an application for refugee status and it's rejected, they can reapply to the commission. And if the commission rejects it or denies it, they have a third chance, which is a TAM, which is Migration Tribunal, which is unique in Latin America. There's only one in Canada and one in Costa Rica. This is an independent, standalone level where people can reapply to have their case reviewed. This migration tribunal is made up by three judges. Two have to be lawyers, and the third one can be from any professions. Today, it's made up by two attorneys and a psychologist. So the challenge is to decide what happens with the citizens that have not met the requirements to be refugees and what kind of status can be given to them. Nowadays, Costa Rica does not have the refoulement position. That is to say, if the citizen is not recognized uh, as a refugee, he's not returned to his or her country. They can remain in the country. It's taken about four years for the entire process. And if at the end of those four years, the refugee status is not granted, he or she can apply for a different migration category. I feel that the majority of the citizens re apply for refugee status as the quickest way to become uh, regular migrants. Once they are refuge applicants in my country after three months, they can be given a work permit. I did my math here, says the moderator. So if you used to have five people doing 200 applications, that's 40 a year each. And now we're talking about 1,600 or 2,000 each year. But you talk about 10%, so about 10,000 approval or so approvals. So this is an important issue that needs to be made visible because oftentimes the pressure of having no status creates a lot of anxiety and expectations. And Alberto, I have a question for you because Nicaraguans are very anxious right now. So my question is, could you give me an idea of what, uh, what is the reality that Nicaraguans are living? right now? Tal vez empezaría señalando. I would begin by talking about what Harold has pointed out. The first thing I would like to say 
says Alberto, is that in real terms, the percentage of those 70, plus minus 70,000 Nicaraguas that are requesting asylum are people that are aware of already in Costa Rica and that see this as an opportunity to have their status um, regularized. So they were not regular migrants before as a result of the, their situation and now they're taking this opportunity to change that. However, I think it's very important for the government to understand how strategic it is to be able to give the people that are applying for the right category what they're asking for. And even though the country is going through a, a really complicated juncture because their political and economic situation is very complicated, I'm not going to talk about it now, but that's part of the reason why a decision is made one way or another in terms of uh, migration applications. I'm talking about xenophobia, the economic situation, which is not um, good, it's not growing, compounded by the, this tax situation, which makes it really hard to have migration policies that may appear to be too open and flexible for the migrant population. However, not applying under the right category also adds complexities that do not make it possible to channel the proper resources for the population or having a right an idea of or control over this population with the characteristics that I mentioned before. This is highly skilled population that could easily be part of uh, productive um, activities which could pose a threat to certain sectors who had never felt that pressure or that threat from the Nicaraguan population, but also has certain limitations, but still can contribute to the economy. So this is a population that also re receives remittances. Just because they are middle class and that work in the productive sector that have ties to Nicaragua uh, does not mean that uh, these people will not be sending remittances, which is what enabled them to survive in Costa Rica. Now, the, the situation is critical. I was working with refuge, refugee populations, and there are three critical issues that always come up. First, the issue of employment as the most critical one of all, one of all, together with uncertainty because they don't know what's going to happen at the end of that year period, and some of them are nearing that year period because they started the process after April of last year, and we are at the end of almost, almost at the end of 2019. So that's an issue that starts coming to their minds. What happens with their work permit expires? because they got that when they requested for the refugee status. So we, they need a quick answer to that because otherwise it could become uh, more complicated. So this is one first topic. And then here, unlike previous migration flows, these people don't want to work in the agricultural area or in construction, which is where where permits are given, the areas in which permits are given. So there's a mismatch between the profile of this refugee population and the type of activity that uh, is given permits for in order to become regular refugees. So that population do not want to work in the agricultural field. They don't know how to do it. And also, they want to continue doing citizen activism. In Costa Rica, a lot of citizen activism is taking place at the, ne at the social network level, uh, also in terms of keeping in touch with the people back in Nicaragua. So there's also, there's also opinion uh, shows, Confidencial, led by uh, Mr. Chamorro, who's the most recognized journalist in the country. And this week, uh, that uh, they're showing a program, the show that was made in Costa Rica. That might change later on, but this week's show has been filmed in Costa Rica. So since Mr. Chamorro um, left, 
the location where this show is being produced is Costa Rica. So let's say that this is a population that doesn't, um, that does not want to go to a refugee camp because they're not thinking short term. They're not there for a month. For example, Cubans. Cubans were on the way up north and they just wanted a, a transit area. This population is not thinking about going back to the country and until the situation in Nicaragua gets resolved. So they're thinking long, long term. And for them, it doesn't make sense e either to go work in remote areas because they want to be close to the downtown area to continue with their activist activities. So that's another layer of, of complexity. Another issue is access to health care. And there's a big contradiction between the willingness by the government to abide by international regulations and the spirit itself and the domestic legislation which says that health is a right, pretty much, that everybody should have access to. And also the operational situation of the Social Security administrations that poses certain restrictions. In some cases, not just for foreigners, but also for Costa Ricans themselves that do not contribute to the Social Security Administration. And to that, we must add the the institutional xenophobia, but public officials that make it specifically hard for the refugee population, even if they are paying into the system. That has to do with non-complying with guidelines coming from the heads of the Social Security Administration itself, also non-complying with the legislation. And it also has to do with misinformation and lack of empathy. So I believe there has to be a bigger effort made to make the population that's working in the front line with the population of the refugee population and making them more aware. And there has to be more empowerment uh, by the civil society and their refugees. Uh, and to a lesser extent, another issue is education. There's also arbitrary decisions being made and a requirement, for example, to enroll the kids in school is for the parents to have a national ID and they come up with requirements that are not really legal. These are just uh, obstacles to prevent uh, migrant children to have access to education, and education is, after all, a universal right. The moderator says bureaucratic decisions. We call it the concierge, the concierge's power, right? We have about 15 minutes left, so I would like to open it up for questions and comments now. We held a series of surveys in several countries, Costa Rica included, to determine the multiplier effect that migration has. Because the reality is that even these, even if these conflicts appear to be temporary in nature, uh, Venezuela, Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua have pretty much uh, become extended conflicts uh, which do not have a solution in the short term. So as part of this survey, about 50% of the uh, respondents said that they were thinking about staying in that country and bringing their families over. So thinking in terms of what Alberto was saying, you know, the issue of employment, the issue of uh, xenophobia or anti-immigration uh, feelings or a lack of access to health or education, what kind of challenges do governments have? So I leave this question for the panelists because at this rate, if the root causes do not get resolved in the short term and more and more people will keep coming to our countries, what's going to happen? So, uh, Alberto, will you go out to say something? Go ahead. Yes. La migración. As usual, says Alberto, migration is politically motivated at the beginning, but it evolves into a situation where other elements start playing a part. Economically, you know, Nicaragua is going through a deep crisis and a very significant economic slowdown with no access to credit for significant sectors of the population, specifically the rural areas, which will mean that there's going to be in an increase in immigration and even climate change which has been relentless along the Central American Pacific, but most specifically in the Nicaraguan rural areas. So 
we have a political situation which is no longer on the headlines uh, like before, but uh, continues to be serious and there continues to be political harassment with uh, selective extrajudicial killings in Nicaragua. And economically speaking, we have this critical situation that will create more migration or that will prevent uh, migrants from returning to Nicaragua. Let us remember that back in the 80s, the refugee population that we had here, and I would say in how far behind Harold those data are, because in the 80s there were a lot more formal refugees. But what happened is that that migration stayed in Costa Rica for the entire 80s, and in early 90s they returned to Nicaragua when the political situation changed. So more likely than not, uh, the current migration population will do something similar according to the data from the surveys that Manuel was referring to. The moderator uh, says, we would like to hear from you. I was born in Nicaragua, but I was taken out of Nicaragua to Costa Rica, and I never applied uh, for refugee status. I was uh, with a student visa and some other types of status. However, back then, I remember there were about 36,000 Nicaraguans that have received uh, refugee status in a very short term. So I don't know what's going on with that. Harold, just to provide a little bit of background information, nowadays Costa Rica has a 12% unemployment rate. And that unemployment happens mostly among the young, ages, ages 18 through 35. So we have the highest unemployment rate in that age group. And one of every five Costa Rican is poor. For about 20 years, 20% 20 of Costa Ricans are poor. <coughs> so, any type of policy that is devised for foreigners also must have, will uh, create some sort of xenophobia. So the government needs to address the needs of their own citizens as well to prevent that. And that's why we have been very careful in how this message is conveyed. Because we know it's a human rights issue. And above all, we have the dignity and respect for those people, regardless of their migration status. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, when an asylum applies when a migrant applies for refugee status you give you are given this foreign ID card which is called DMEX that quote unquote gives you a right to access to rights to health and education and after three months you have a right to apply for a work permit back to the moderator questions comments if you don't ask any questions, we will quiz you. Harold, again. Costa Rica requests a visa from Nicaraguan citizens. So if a Nicaraguan wants to go to Costa Rica, he or she must apply for a visa at the Costa Rican consulate offices in Nicaragua. And that costs $32. Now, for refugee status, there's no cost. And for Venezuelan citizens, Costa Rica does not require a visa. Questions? Okay, we have a here. Okay, we have Okay, el fondo primero. Okay, we go to the back of the room first, then here to the front. We'll take three questions and then we'll answer. Make sure your questions are good, please. No pressure. For Mr. Torres Salas from Voice of America, I had a, a question. At the beginning, you talked about Salvadoran refugees that are arriving, that are deserting from 
gangs. Are these former gang members when you talk about that? Or are these people that used to live in areas that were taken by gangs and they fled to Costa Rica? Could you please clarify that? Second question. Uh, Carmen from the Fletcher School. Um, we've talked a little bit about root causes, but we haven't talked about political initiatives with Nicaragua, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on that. So, the moderator says, are you talking about Costa Rica's foreign policy on Nicaragua? Is that what your question aims at? The microphone, please. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, the policy, but also then how uh, relations with Nicaragua end up affecting the response internally. Yeah, that's a uh, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, We can also ask the ambassador to answer that question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, buenos dias. Good morning, I'm Andrea Tranco here from the Migration Policy Institute. I just wanted to see if you could clarify the process to apply for this temporary work permit. So once you uh, apply for refugee status, after three months you get work permit and then you need to wait for their case to be resolved. But that, does that permit expire after a year and if so, can it be renewed? The second question is, could you talk a little bit more about the invitation for Nicaraguans to register for the agricultural uh, sector, how you arrived at that uh, decision, whether you worked it out with the industry and whether the response has been positive and also the challenges of formality versus informality in the work. The moderator says in Costa Rica it went from 35 to 42 percent, but he's not using the microphones. Carlos Andres says, okay, to provide some background information, Costa Rica estimated that the contribution made by migrants is 12 percent of our GDP. So this is a significant amount and that is why we understood that that they are fully assimilated to our economy. We know that there are also informal sectors of the economy, but that's our challenge, not only for migrants, but for Costa Ricans in general, because informal work is a phenomenon that happens at a country level. It has nothing to do with migration only. But in the agricultural area, we make things easier in, in terms of streamlining processes and with larger coverage, because they not only have to do to go to the National Migration Office and Foreign uh, Citizen Affairs, but also to the Ministry of Labor. So we're trying to streamline everything into a one-stop type of window so that they can go to one place. That is not the case yet, but we are working on it and this is uh, with the help with the IDB. Regarding the question from gangs in El Salvador, I have to say that there's a little bit of everything. We have people that were harassed by gangs or whose family members are gang members or some of them have deserted gangs. And in all cases, they have been persecuted. In some cases, people from the community uh, from sexual diversity have also been targeted of persecution. So, and we have received some applications from them as well. Like I said before, the government of my country believes in projects that are sustainable and long term. We believe that this is the only option because for, you know, for to regularize people, we can be very creative. There's different ways, different, um, we can call it humanitarian protection, temporary status, and in Costa Rica, more likely than not, we will have a temporary regularization, but the president wants to have a specific, uh, concrete project to resolve this issue because the challenge comes afterwards once they become regular migrants. What are we going to do with them? What kind of status are they going to ha have? So we're not just dealing with the issue of regularization, but rather we want to take it a step forward and try to turn the traditional view 
Iran of, you know, what are we going to get from international cooperation, but rather say these T tell the international community, these are our needs, these are our projects, to so what extent can you help us? With the OAS, we've also been working in Costa Rica. We have a Betilde here, and we have a project to strengthen uh, institutional capacity in our country. So like somebody said, we have to make a big effort uh, to make our population more aware, like Mr. Alberto Cortez said. Uh, awareness is part of our national integration policy in 2013-2023, where integration will be key, but it has to go hand in hand with awareness and a policy where officials understand the contribution that migrants make to our economy. Like I said, 12% of our GDP. So we have to see migration not as an issue, but rather as something that we need to be addressed and that can ultimately benefit everybody if we see each other as a large family under one roof, which is our country. Harold, like I said before, the refugee status is an exceptional category within the migration issue. Not all people will be granted the refugee status. My big concern is that the refugee uh, status option has been used as an option to become a regular migrant. But like I said, not everybody meets the requirement to be considered a refugee. It is an exception in the immigration system. It has to do with protecting people's lives for people that are truly being persecuted in their home countries because of their political opinions or for any other political reasons. So the easy way out to become regular in our country is by applying for refugee status. And that's why it's important to find other ways for people to become regular migrants without having to resort to the refugee status. Once you uh, apply for the refugee status, you are given an appointment to be interviewed. And that's where the file then is created. And that appointment might be given perhaps six months from now, a year from now, because there's a lot of people applying for it. And once you have been interviewed, that is when you're given the work permit. The law states that it has to be three months after the uh, application has been uh, given, but right now it is being uh, granted upon three months or upon uh, the interview being held. So this is an open work permit. There's no uh, expiration date for it. Mr. Ambassador? Would you like to talk a little bit about how Costa Rica, uh, from the diplomatic uh, and the political uh, standpoint, is addressing these issues? Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank the Migration Policy Institute for this invitation, for the opportunity to talk about an issue that is uh, critical, not only for Central America, but truly for the entire region, the entire hemisphere. Costa Rica has uh, obviously uh, diplomatic relations with Nicaragua. It's always been that way. And we understand that the most important thing is to maintain these relations, especially the consulates in both countries. So we have embassies. We have uh, embassy uh, to embassy uh, uh, talks and, uh, you know, Ambassadors are being appointed, and obviously we have one country uh, proposes a, a candidate to the amb ambassador, and the other country accepts the uh, uh, information presented. And obviously Costa Rica has always looked upon improving the way in which democracy is uh, being respected. And obviously for Nicaragua, we look for this uh, during the electoral process, but not just the elections, but also uh, in how the government relates to its people and society. And Costa Rica 
also always seeks that human rights are always respected in every sense of the word in Nicaragua. And Costa Rica understands that there are many opportunities in which Nicaragua can improve upon uh, the way in which it understands human rights to be applied. And this has also been stated by the President in his recent speech before the United Nations, in which he talked about Nicaragua, stating that the Nicaraguan government must respect human rights in every uh, respect in Nicaragua. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. And with this, we uh, and uh, the discussion, Alberto, Carol, Ca Carlos, and uh, Harold, thank you for your participation. And on to the next.